Hello, everyone. Do you hear me OK? Excellent. Uh, well, I'm going to get started now because no one's ever accused me of brevity. Uh, my name is Josh Brown White. Uh, I work for Microsoft's customer security and trust team. Um, you know, the responsibilities of that organization is basically to continue to evolve Microsoft's secure development lifecycle uh, to maintain its effectiveness as the security landscape changes and as the capabilities in the landscape change. Um, and then to kind of institutionalize those practices in our engineering culture. Um, my specific role is to lead the team that's involved in security analysis. So the various automation techniques that we utilize to analyze our code and products to try to minimize the number of vulnerabilities that are present within them. Um, and the primary weapon in that quiver is static analysis. Through the history of the SDL at Microsoft, we have repeatedly found that it's the most effective tool at minimizing the implementation level vulnerabilities in the product. Um, but kind of early on in the stages of the SDL, uh, while it was effective at identifying the problems, it was also very effective at identifying non-problems. It was incredibly painful to use. Uh, but we were uh, comfortable just using blunt force implements, you know, kind of in the slammer and blaster days. You know, we stopped all development on, on our products to address security. So there was a large appetite for inconvenience. Uh, in this day and age of kind of continuous deployment and such, you know, when everyone is trying to be faster, code velocity is the term of the day, uh, those level of inconveniences are no longer tolerable. Um, and you know, security analysis that is uh, introducing a lot of friction within the development process is going to be security analysis that's quickly ignored, uh, usually with a lot of negative feedback from all of the people that are subject to it. Um, this isn't the first time that I've been involved in this. Uh, I've kind of deployed static analysis at a number of other enterprises in a previous life. And much of this presentation comes from you know, notions that I wish I could have gone back in time and told younger version of me, keep these things in mind as you're evaluating solutions, considering how to deploy them. They'll make your life easier. They'll make the engineering life easier. Uh, and, and all around, um, the, the solution will be a lot more effective because of that. Uh, so that's the primary content of, uh, and purpose of this presentation. Uh, so to get there, I'm going to start with just kind of a broad overview of static analysis, what its makeup is, how it works, um, kind of common terminology in it, so that as I reference terms and use vocabulary, we're all on the same page. You know what I mean? Uh, you kind of have a sense for what it's doing under the covers and that sort of thing. Uh, and then I'm going to, you know, the, the bulk of this presentation is going to delve into uh, various factors that cause static analysis to, in practice, uh, be a hindrance to development as opposed to an asset in producing uh, secure, robust products. Um, and then, you know, I'll end with the obligatory con uh, contact slide and all that good stuff. Um, a specific note, I'm not here to shill for any product, uh, nor am I going to badmouth products like by name, though if you're familiar with some of them, you may recognize the ones I'm making digs at. Uh, I am opinionated in this space, and there are a number of products that uh, don't really live up to the experience they should be delivering. Um, so to delve in, uh, static analysis, hopefully most people know what I'm talking about, and that's why they're here, but uh, you know, just to level set, uh, it's an automated method of inspecting you know, source code on disk or source code as it's compiling, or the exhaust of the compilation process, you know, your bytecode or your binaries or whatever for flaws. Um, it's crucially not executing the code as part of this analysis, which is what distinguishes it from other automation techniques to look for vulnerabilities, things like dynamic analysis or runtime analysis. So the static comes from it doesn't need to execute the code. Um, and within static analysis, there's uh, five kind of primary buckets of things we're trying to detect, uh, or kind of analysis techniques that we use to detect problems. Uh, the first is very simplistic. We're just looking for uh, various band APIs or kind of band assignments. Um, these are typically problems that, like, grepping is a sufficient tool to find. Like, hey, is stir copy present anywhere in my uh, source code? Um, they're very simplistic checks. Uh, they're very easy to implement. You don't even really need static analysis. You can just use a search feature of your IDE to find them. Um, 
but very quickly, we get to kind of a category that requires significantly more intelligence on the part of the tools. So this is where it's not the use of a specific API uh, that's uh, fundamentally a problem, but how it is used, the context that uh, it's used in, that kind of differentiates between whether or not it's an issue. Um, so it's kind of a quick example. In older model view controller frameworks, uh, there's a persistent problem where if you remove a column from your view, but you don't also exclude it from your controller, then you have a security vulnerability. If you exclude it from both places, you're fine. If you don't exclude it in either place, you're also fine. So you're looking for specifically that co context to determine whether or not it's a vulnerability. Um, kind of within the contextual category, there are uh, three specific analysis techniques that come up most frequently. Uh, the first is control flow analysis. You're looking for all of the execution paths through an application uh, to see if there is a specific path in which your condition is met. So um, you, when, when we look at native code for problems like memory corruption, control flow is the primary analysis technique we're looking for. You, we're looking for, you know, is there any path through all of the conditionals and branches where, for example, we freed memory and then we're trying to use that memory again without doing an additional allocation. Um, so that's not to say that it doesn't apply to more modern uh, programming languages, but it is most applicable within the realm of unmanaged code. Uh, for more modern languages, uh, we frequently use uh, a technique called data flow, which is similar to control flow, but we're rather looking for how a particular value might flow through an application. So uh, a good example of this is for symmetric encryption functions, uh, they have this concept of an in initialization vector, uh, which must be cryptographically randomly generated. Uh, it can't be generated with just RAND or some of the other garbage random number generators. It has to be specifically cryptographically random. Um, and so what you would want to do is, like, once you find an instance of the uh, symmetric function, AES or what have you, uh, look for its initialization vector parameter and backtrack through the application to see if there's ever an instance where it is initialized to something that isn't cryptographically random. So you're looking at the flow of that data. And as a specific subset of that, uh, most relevant to things like web applications and most modern uh, software is taint flow where you're very specifically looking for untrusted data that is entering the application uh, that then flows into a method or function or assignment that is where it's not safe to use untrusted data. And you also want to check to make sure that in between the ingestion and the use, there isn't a function that turns it into something that's safe. So these are things like cross-site scripting, command injection, deserialization attacks, and that sort of thing. They're heavily reliant on being able to understand how taint enters the application and flows down to an actual usage. Um, so these are kind of the broad catch-all categories. There are various detections that fall outside of these, but these will make up the majority of things that a good analysis solution uh, needs to be capable of performing. Um, so within static analysis, you know, we, we tend to gravitate to it as a solution for a number of strengths. Um, the first is that uh, if it understands how to analyze a language, it hypothetically doesn't matter what sort of application you're building in that language. So if you're analyzing C Sharp, it doesn't matter if you're building a web application, a Windows form app, a command line app, a Blazor code because you're trying to script the DOM. You know, so long as it understands and is able to uh, kind of parse and build a model of the C Sharp, it hypothetically can cover all of those. Now, it still needs relevant checks to leverage that capability to be of use, but that's, you know, it distinguishes itself from things like dynamic analysis, where you know, maybe you have a web app scanner, and that's great if you have a web app, but if you're writing a mobile app, it's completely worthless. Um, so it's able to span types of applications. Uh, and this is important because there are a ton of application types where there just doesn't exist good generalized dynamic or runtime analysis uh, on the market. Um, so often this makes static analysis really the only automation choice for those sorts of applications. Um, because it's not executing the code as part of the analysis, it typically scales much, much better than either dynamic or runtime analysis. Um, 
So it doesn't have the overhead and compute required to run often several permutations of the application uh, in, in order to perform the analysis, which is both quicker and uses significantly less compute. And crucially, because it's not executing the application and analyzing the behavior as the application runs, uh, there are many fewer variables uh, involved in the detection of results. Um, so if you run the same version of static analysis on the same source code with the same rule set, you should get the same results every time. Uh, in you kind of the dynamic or runtime space, uh, the order in which you run the uh, you know, various tests, the initial state of the machine, uh, all of these things will introduce variables that can frequently cause you to get different results depending on uh, those variables. Um, so the reproducibility of the results is an important strength. Um, it's also much easier to quantify how much of your application is analyzed. You know, the tool will typically tell you, hey, I've scanned this many lines of code. You compare that to the lines of code on disk, and boom, you've just quantified that. You know, if you look at uh, you know, the kind of other automation tools, you have to invest quite a bit to instrument your code in order to measure how much of the functionality was executed. And even that is you know, kind of a very fuzzy science. So um, you know, with other tooling, it's really hard to tell, hey, have I covered all of my application? Uh, whereas with static analysis, it's generally easy to answer that question. Now, providing full coverage of your application may be more involved. Uh, most uh, static analysis requires you to compile compiled languages. And um, as part of that compilation step, things like conditional compilation flags within the source code can cause you to not uh, analyze some of that source. Um, so just because it's easy to quantify doesn't mean it's necessarily trivial to get full coverage. Uh, you know, it still can require a bit of work on your part. Uh, but most importantly, uh, static analysis, because it's looking at the source code or you know, some output that's representative of the source code that it can map back to specific lines, it can point us as developers to exactly the lines of code that caused it to think something's a problem and focus our attention on fixing that, uh, which really reduces the amount of labor it takes to address any finding. You know, if you compare this to other tools or things like penetration testing or whatever that's observing the behavior of the application after it's running, uh, there's often quite a bit of investigation to backtrack to the actual offending lines of code that need to be changed. Uh, so their findings require significant labor to address in some cases, whereas uh, you know, for static analysis, at the very least, you know what to change pretty quickly. But it's not all rainbows and unicorns. It's, it's not a perfect technology, even in abstraction. Um, the first is you know, pretty obvious. Uh, it only has the context available of the code it's able to analyze. So if you have several microservices, and it's only their behavior together where the problem uh, arises, you know, one microservice is ingesting the data, and it's you know, a third microservice is actually exhausting it in some dangerous context. If you analyze each of those individually, you're not going to see that behavior. You're not going to see that pattern. Um, so it takes a fair bit of work to kind of understand the scope of your analysis target and make sure that you're including all of the context in order to find these problems. It's not typically a problem for all of the analysis solutions that are actually executing the application, because typically you have everything together when you're able to execute the app. Um, so context requires a bit more labor. Um, there's less clear, clear criteria over what constitutes a problem. Um, and by this, I mean, uh, you know, as an example, uh, a lot of people just categorically consider memcopy dangerous in the C world. Um, and it's true that it is a very, it's very prone to flaws. That said, it, there's also not a good replacement. So some tools take the approach of only flagging usages of memcopy where there's a clear path where a, an attacker could influence the execution of memcopy. Other tools completely flag it. They call it a banned API. All instances they consider bad. And there's no agreement over which of those approaches is correct. And that's true for kind of a vast majority of uh, analysis techniques in this space. Um, so you know, not only do the vendors not speak the same language, uh, you know, when they're talking to customers, the various, uh, you know, us as consumers of these tools may have a very different notion of what uh, is considered a false positive than the people writing the rules. Uh, 
and because of that, it, it, you know, since there's not a common language and a common understanding, it's really hard to uh, have a abstract sense of you know, what multiple tools mean when they're talking about what a finding is. Um, you know, the, the flip side to a tool being able to scan all applications in a specific language is if they need to support multiple languages, that's a discrete effort per language. You know, the effort to support two languages is roughly twice the effort to support one language. Um, and this can be a problem because most of the commercial vendors anywhere are not doubling their staff when they go up to two, two uh, languages. You know, they're not tripling it to go from one to three and that sort of thing. Um, you know, if we compare this against something like a web app scanner, it ultimately doesn't care the underlying language of, that the application's written in. Um, you know, it doesn't care if it's C Sharp or Ruby or PHP or what have you. Um, you know, it just cares that it's a web application and it understands how to scan those. Uh, so that's, you know, kind of really how those, you know, two technologies differentiate themselves. And then finally, I wish this went without saying, but unfortunately it doesn't, uh, all automation, but especially static analysis, is really terrible at identifying design level mistakes. You know, if you want to find a design mistake, you should do a security review of your design or have pen testing after the fact. Um, it takes five seconds for a human to look at a forgot password flow and go, wow, asking someone their favorite color like they're three years old before you let them reset their password is stupid. Uh, it's really hard to look at the source code, even as a human, and go, oh, the source code's asking people for their favorite color, and that's the only gate to resetting the password. Um, understanding the broader context of you know, how that's manifesting as a user experience is something that static analysis is terrible at. Um, that said, a, a lot of vendors still, so they can up the number of CD, uh, CWEs they claim to find, will claim to find some of the design level mistakes anyway. Uh, all that being said, um, you know, I, I, I would assert uh, that the, the weaknesses of static analysis uh, are generally uh, less comparable to other analysis solutions. And as I mentioned, sometimes it's the only automation option. Uh, and the strengths are typically comparable or better, especially the strength of being able to directly pinpoint the lines of code that are responsible for a problem. Um, and so because of that, you know, it tends to be the go-to technology that consultants will recommend people adopt and so forth. Uh, you know, most, uh, you know, guidance and compliance regimes uh, at the very least recommend it, if not outright required. So, you know, if everyone's agreeing that this is a great technology, uh, you know, where's this angry mob of engineers that I titled my uh, slide off of? Um, and, you know, the strengths and weaknesses were tools and abstract, kind of absent poor implementations. Uh, in practice, the implementations lead to a concept called notification fatigue. And this uh, idea is basically that the more interruption you receive from something calling attention to itself, uh, the more likely you are to kind of be exhausted and frustrated by that. And we're familiar with this in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, you know, the first thing we do after downloading an app on our smartphone is revoke its ability to harass us and buzz our smartwatches and all of that, uh, you know, reminding us that we just installed it uh, and that, you know, it's been 30 seconds since we last looked at it. Um, you know, we see it when we enable monitoring and alerting of our applications. There's usually a significant period where, you know, we're just trying to get a handle on the volume of notifications coming in and, and make sure that, uh, you know, we're kind of able to process them without being frustrated. Uh, and, and the same is absolutely true for static analysis. The kind of, um, you know, it, it's way of alerting us to problems um, can either be very helpful if it's done judiciously or an actual hindrance. And, you know, what we've discovered, you know, kind of across the board with, you know, incoming notifications, regardless of the context, is if we start feeling notification fatigue, if we just start ignoring them or we procrastinate, oh, I'll get back to that email later when I'm, you know, not free and later can turn into never. The same thing's true for static analysis. You know, uh, I if we're starting to feel notification fatigue as uh, engineers while we're using it, we're gonna start ignoring those uh, or just outright disabling certain rules. And that'll lead to both a false sense of security. Oh yeah, we're running all these tools that find these problems when in fact we're not processing them. Or, uh, you know, it's actually getting in the way of us doing our primary jobs of writing code and getting product out there and that sort of thing. Um, and there's, uh, you know, s 
five primary factors that lead to notification fatigue. And the first is just, if you're dealing with a high volume of notifications, um, it doesn't matter if they're all notifications you absolutely should pay attention to. If it's just that that's becoming what you're doing all day, um, you're going to get tired of it. Um, it's even worse if a large percentage of the notifications you're dealing with are not actually notifications that deserve your attention. Um, you know, they're eyes, either like falsely triggered or they're to alert you for things that really don't matter. Um, if these notifications are being presented in a very invasive way, which is a particular problem for static analysis that integrates into our dev environment, you know, into our IDEs. You know, if in the, while well, I'm building my mental model of you know, the source code I intend to write and how it's interacting with the source code right there, and then I'm pulled out of that because you know, my static analysis solution is trying to draw my attention to something, uh, I'm going to get very frustrated if that's happening frequently, if it doesn't actually really require my attention, or if there's nothing I can do about it. So the more invasive static analysis is into our dev process, the more judicious it needs to be in all the other categories that lead to notification fatigue. On the flip side, if I'm being notified today of a mistake I made in source code two months ago, um, I'm probably going to postpone dealing with that. You know, I might not even have the source code on my machine anymore. I ne might need to get a new enlistment, get it to build again, then familiarize myself with the code so that I make sure I'm not introducing a regression as I address the problem. And if I have other stuff to do, I'm going to procrastinate. And if those pile up, I'm eventually just not going to do any of that. And then finally, if I can't do anything with the notification, with the finding from static analysis, why even tell me about it? If it's not describing the problem well or telling me what to do about it, if it's basically go to Stack Overflow and spend 20 minutes figuring out what I'm telling you about, uh, well, I'm not going to do that right now, and I might not ever do that ever. Or if it's telling me to deal with something I, that there's no solution for. You know, it's kind of common knowledge in the C world that you shouldn't use Sterling uh, because uh, it reads until there's a null terminator. If you're dealing with a string that they forgot to null terminate, you're reading through memory until it finds null. It's dangerous. But if you're writing straight C code, there's not an option otherwise. So telling me I'm using Sterling all over the place is actively in, like aggravating. It's like, yes, yes, I know that sucks. Thanks. Yeah, my language sucks. Sorry. Um, so uh, all of these things kind of contribute to uh, the, the overall uh, feeling of notification fatigue. Uh, and to kind of describe the aspects of static analysis that generate one or more of those like components of notification fatigue, uh, I kind of have four broad issues. Uh, I've completely made up the names for these issues, so don't bother Googling them. They are Joshisms. Uh, but they're kind of metaphors to try to categorize these problems. Um, so, you know, to start off with, I think that we all kind of intuitively know that the screwdrivers on the right are for a different job than the screwdrivers on the left, and it's not going to be terribly productive to try to swap those screwdrivers uh, and, you know, uh, use the ones on the left to do the jobs of the one on the right. And the same is true for static analysis. You know, I'm referencing it so far as if it's one thing. But there's actually several categories within static analysis really meant to perform different tasks in different contexts. Um, the first is very simplistic. It's you know, basically just text parsing of source code. Uh, you know, these are your linters and so forth um, that are you know, very fast. Uh, and you don't even need the code to compile. You can even run them on code snippets off of Stack Overflow to see if they're garbage or not. Um, they're very simple to use. They're very simple to run. Uh, and in a security context, they are entirely sufficient to enforce things like banned APIs. You know, make sure you're not using a broken cryptography function, or you know, uh, if you're you know kind of in the native world, like you know some of the uh, unsafe C functions, or you know in .NET, you know we want to eventually deprecate some uh, you know unsafe APIs there. Uh, you know this would be a useful tool to notify you of their usage. Um, but because it's just parsing through the text document, it has no sense of the broader context of the application, it's understandably terrible at all problems that are contextual. So if I'm using HTML.raw to exhaust you know, HTML in my response, and I pass it a variable, um, text parsing is going to have no idea where that variable is from or uh, you know, what, whether it represents a safe or dangerous value. So, you know, 
if it, it has either the choice of not trying to solve that problem, which is the correct choice because it's poorly suited to solve that problem, or assuming all usages of HTML.raw where the relevant context isn't within it, uh, to call it safe, even if it might not be, or dangerous, even if it's completely safe. Um, the first one will give you kind of a false sense of security about your application. It'll produce uh, false negatives. It will incorrectly say that you are free of problems. The latter will produce a ton of false positives. It will bombard you with notifications that represent things that don't actually need your attention. Uh, and if it, if uh, you kind of the, the linters and so forth take that approach, you're very quickly going to disable those security rules because it's going to be like completely aggravating and interfere with the dev process. Um, to address that, we start getting more complex. So um, you know, we start building a semantic model of the source code. And you know, in, in the least sophisticated way, um, you know, we start looking at some models restricted to a kind of localized scope. Uh, these days, typically, either, you know, just a model of all of the contents within a file or within a class. And so you'll end up with kind of many individual models. Um, and you know, this is fine if you're looking for uh, the context, if it exists entirely within that class. If you're ingesting the data, um, transforming it, and then passing it to you know, one of the functions that's unsafe to use with tainted data, all within the confines of this class, it's, completely fine. it's a completely suitable tool to find that. Um, and it's also better at finding banned API because it can check the namespace of the API and make sure, oh, it is actually the banned one and not something that's just coincidentally named the same thing. Um, but you know, it, it falls into the same trap as text parsing if the context lives outside of the scope it's trying to analyze. And it has to make the same trade-offs. And hopefully the trade-offs it makes are to resolve to simply not look for the problems that it can't get the context for. Uh, otherwise, it will generate a bunch of garbage notifications. To address that, we start moving into properly sophisticated static analysis. Uh, Interprocedural static analysis is modeling the whole analysis target, all of the code that you've pointed it at at once. So it's able to track context through all of your assemblies, through all of your classes and that sort of thing. Uh, and that makes it pretty good at following context. Uh, where it falls down, though, is if you have data that enters your application, gets written to persistent storage, and then elsewhere in your application, retrieved from persistent storage, and then utilized in an unsafe way. Um, so this is the model for things like stored cross-site scripting. Uh, it's fairly common with serialized payloads and that sort of thing. Um, and so there is kind of a superset of interprocedural analysis uh, that's actually trying to correlate all of the usages of persistent storage so it can track data in and out of it. Um, in these last two cases, these are relatively redundant tools. Uh, you know, if given the option, the one with storage flow is better. They have, you know, kind of overall the same uh, negatives, uh, but the one the interprocedural analysis with storage flow has more positives. And it, it generally represents the state of the art for static analysis today. It's able to like grab all of the context that's hypothetically available to it and keep that in mind as it's performing the analysis. So why wouldn't you always use that? Well, uh, first of all, uh, the interprocedural tools are almost exclusively commercial tools. Um, they just literally cost more to use. You have to go to a vendor who's going to try to upsell you a million things. Uh, and that can be a pretty significant barrier, especially for smaller dev teams. Uh, whereas you know, your text parsers, your local scope analyzers are typically either open source or they're free from a vendor. You know, they're free of charge. And uh, that's a pretty significant benefit to them. Uh, paying nothing is better than paying something, you know, usually on average. Um, Additionally, the cost of deploying in a procedural analysis is almost always significantly higher. Um, most of the text parsers, the local scope analyzers, a developer can just add them as an extension uh, within their IDE. There's no licenses to manage. Uh, if they want to put them in their DevOps pipeline, usually all of them have a very good integration story for that. You can grab, you know, gulp tasks for it or, you know, whatever your kind of instrumentation layer is. They, they integrate with almost no friction. Um, 
Whereas the interprocedural analysis, uh, it, it's hard to deploy onto end developer machines um, because you have license management. They tend to be large, heavyweight installs. Many of them are multiple gigabytes. Uh, you know, how do you get that to all of the machines? How do you make sure that they're running with an up-to-date rule set and engine constantly? Um, so more often than not, they're run centrally. As soon as you run things centrally, you need an ops team, you need SLAs and all of that. So uh, they tend to be more expensive to run. Um, and then finally, there is orders of magnitude difference in analysis time between these. Uh, your average text parser is fast enough that you can run it on every keystroke in the IDE without the developer even being aware of it. Even local scope is pretty fast. You fast enough that if you include it in, like, say, your compilation step or whatever, no one will really notice the lag that it produces. Interprocedural analysis, as it's building its control flow and data flow and uh, taint flow graphs through all of the components of the application, it's just a computationally expensive task. And you can do all sorts of optimizations and so forth, but there's just no escaping that graph processing is fundamentally expensive. And you know, a as your source code grows, the cost of producing those graphs and tracking all of their edges grows kind of exponentially. It's not a linear growth rate. Um, so especially as your application grows and becomes you know, larger in magnitude, uh, just the time to run interprocedural analysis becomes a reasonable barrier. So because of that, these tools are really meant to solve different problems. You know, the fast tools are really well suited, pardon me, for the uh, dev environment and to the dev IDE. Um, even though they're very limited, they can run with very low friction. They don't impact the user experience, provided that they've been judicious in how they implement their rules so that they don't try to find things that they are not terribly capable at. Um, whereas trying to run you know, the, the interprocedural analysis on a developer machine, uh, it's doable for smaller code bases. As I said, you have all of the ops overhead of it. But even then, it's probably something that as a developer, you only want to do just before you commit your code. It's not going to be something that you do as you write because of how slow that analysis period is. Uh, and if you have a significant code base, like running it even on a high-end laptop becomes actually like, uh, pretty painful. Um, you might as well go have a long coffee break. Um, in your PR pipeline, uh, again, you know, depending on how long your pull requests tend to be open, uh, you might need to gravitate towards faster tools. So you know, if your average PR is open 10 or 15 minutes because you, know, you tend to make smaller commits uh, and they get reviewed very quickly, um, you're not going to have time to wait for interprocedural analysis. That will start uh, producing lag. And if you have to wait for the analysis to complete before you're able to merge, uh, that's going to start producing friction. Um, and you know, especially if you're trying to like get a break, you know, fix a breaking change in production, that's not something you're going to want to wait for. Um, it is possible for smaller code bases, especially if those code bases are interpreted code. So JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, and so forth. Though, because they don't have a compilation step, uh, doing interprocedural analysis of them tends to be much faster. So those are the more reasonable languages to try interprocedural analysis during your PR. But realistically, you're going to want to do interprocedural analysis kind of out of band. You know, if you have a staging environment in which you do like you know integration testing and uh, you know kind of a comprehensive overview of the applications, you pull everything together. Interprocedural analysis is kind of you know good to run at the same period of time because typically those processes are slower. If you don't have um, you know, kind of the, these slow gates after the code's been merged, then just doing things like running it nightly and cutting work items for the developers to deal with the next day tends to be the best way to adopt them into the process. So with all of that said, you know, kind of fairly obviously, you know, I'm uh, kind of a I'm advocating that you use static analysis for in the positions that that particular tool is well suited for. Use the fast analysis integrated into the dev environment. Don't use it later because you're not like the benefit of it, you know, uh, after the fact, the speed of it doesn't matter. And all you're getting is the weaknesses. At the same time, the slowness and overhead of uh, the, the interprocedural analysis is a poor fit um, early in the dev process. So kind of use the right screwdriver for the job at hand. Uh, 
and, and a little less obviously, but I suspect most people in the room know where I'm going with this, uh, I, I advocate using a mosaic of tools. Put the fast analysis early in the dev process and still use the inner procedural analysis later, even if they have an overlap of what they're detecting. Um, and the rationale for this is because you do ultimately want to find the superset of problems that the inner procedural analysis can find. But for everything that you can find early, we know that it's much cheaper to find it as you're authoring the code or you know, as you have the model of code in your mind. And if you fix it before it's ever committed to your code repository, that's clearly faster than if you fix it after it's been merged into master. Um, and then finally, as I said, like inner procedural analysis is slow and resource intensive. It's still better than dynamic analysis or runtime analysis, but in the static analysis space, it's expensive. And if you're running that on every commit and you have many commits a day, that's real money. You're gonna start seeing that pretty quickly. Um, and so you know, I advocate, especially if you have a larger code base, to run it nightly. Um, that way you don't have to argue with whoever's looking at your cloud compute budget or whatever about your expenditure there. Um, and yes, this means that some problems may make it into production and you don't detect them till that evening and then you address them the next day. Uh, but realistically, you know, the entire DevOps world is about identifying problems that have made it into production and then rectifying them very quickly. Um, and the same is true in the security space. Uh, hackers aren't magicians. You know, when I'm looking at a web app, it will take me significant time unless they've made just egregiously obvious mistakes to find the problems. And if someone, you know, if it's only in production for a couple of days, uh, the chance of an attacker identifying it and exploiting it is basically zero, even if they're a nation state attacker. Um, and so having a little bit of lag there is tolerable. Uh, moving on, just like you can use a tool in kind of uh, the wrong way, uh, you can use a tool for the wrong audience. So these are different people. Uh, your developer's job, you know, is, you know, we, we all know is primarily to take a concept, you know, some sort of feature or idea we want in the application, and through the process of authoring code, put that in the application. Like the job is to turn ideas through code into uh, features. Whereas the job of the security expert is to analyze the application and ensure that it is reasonably free of vulnerabilities. And that's a fundamentally different task than authoring code. Um, and you know, because of this, static analysis needs to serve the needs of those two audiences differently. When I'm using static analysis as a developer, I want it to direct me specifically to the code that I solve as a developer. Okay, point me at the code, tell me what to change. It should be invoking a developer action through its findings. So it should be very, have very low false positives, and all of the findings should be highly actionable. Um, I shouldn't need to really think about it, you know, re-architect my application. It should be directing me to a specific code change. Conversely, when I put on my security expert hat, um, what I'm, very, I'm looking for in a tool is something that makes me faster than doing a manual code review, faster than doing a manual pen test. And so even if I have to go through a bunch of results, they're mostly garbage or ambiguous to find the ones that are uh, really worth my attention. So long as that's faster than the other means, that tool helps me. Um, and I'm not bound by them immediately, uh, immediately needing to be actionable because I don't need to turn that action, uh, the, um, discovery immediately into a code change. Uh, so I have an appetite for things that may require a re-architecture of the application or a broader strategy than fix a couple lines of code. Um, and ideally, when I'm switching these hats, I should get a different UX from the tool because I'm performing different tasks. Unfortunately, most static analysis tools, especially the fast ones, your local scope and your like linters and that sort of thing, don't differentiate between these audiences very well. Uh, and that sucks. Um, and and that, that makes them harder to use well. Um, so you know, what I would recommend to kind of avoid this pitfall is at first, you know, if you're looking at acquiring one of the commercial tools, uh, you can just straight up ask the vendor how they different, you know, what they do to differentiate between the audiences. And if they don't know what you're talking about, uh, they don't differentiate between the audiences. Um, if they do have uh, claims that they do, uh, you can verify them pretty easily. Uh, if you're able to actually inspect 
the rules and logic that they execute to find problems, it'll have metadata associated with it that kind of distinguish between the audiences. And if it doesn't do that, at least the findings should have metadata attached. And usually this is in the form of like a confidence or a precision rating. High confidence means it's typically targeted at developers. A lower confidence means that you know, the results are more ambiguous. They're expecting someone with a kind of a security subject matter expertise to review those findings to determine, you know, to cut through the ambiguity. Um, or alternatively, they'll kind of overload the severity field. So instead of saying critical, important, moderate, whatever, they'll say review or something to that effect. Um, if the tool actually offers a distinct user experience, uh, that's a pretty concrete uh, evidence that the vendors producing these tools uh, or, or the open source teams or whatever have intentionally considered the different roles that are using it and built their tool with that in mind. Conversely, if the response of the vendor is, well, you just need to tune the rule sets to find the rules that your developers are comfortable with, um, what they're really saying is, we can't be bothered to distinguish between these two audiences. We want you to do our job for us. And maybe the tool is good enough that it is worth suffering that pain, but at the very least, you should use that as a hammer to bludgeon a lower licensing cost out of them because they are deficient relative to some of the other vendors in that space. Uh, moving on, um, so I don't know how universally this translates. In the US, uh, we have this concept of one-size-fits-all clothing, which basically means it's huge and technically anyone can wear it. Um, you know, but what's you know, clear when you look at it is, well, in this case, that's not going to fit all of the dinosaurs on the screen or the flying reptile or whatever. And similarly, it is really hard, uh, no matter how much care someone puts into authoring a check, for it to apply across every team, even if they're all writing the same type of application. Uh, and as a, you know, to demonstrate why this is, this is a, the typical model of what taint flow analysis looks like. So it's looking to find, hey, are there sources that I know are typically tainted? You know, things like you know, the query string that's coming into the web request. Uh, are they applying any function that would convert that into something that's safe to consume? And is it flowing ultimately to a function that can't be used safely with that untrusted data? Uh, so that, you know, almost all of the taint flow style uh, problems follow this pattern, you know, cross-site scripting, deserialization, uh, et cetera. Um, but really quickly, you know, we can start spotting problems. Like what if you have a source that's in their list of dangerous sources, but in your threat model it's safe? You know, what if your admins can intentionally submit HTML to your application to get displayed? What if that's the feature of your application? Well, you're not going to want every path where that happens to be flagged as dangerous. Uh, and if you're not able to alter the rules, um, you're either going to have to disable that rule or aggravate the hell out of you know, all of the developers that are consuming it. Uh, and instead of being aggravated, they're just going to ignore those findings, even if hidden within them are some actual true findings from other sources. Um, you know, on the flip side, you know, what if you have a source that's dangerous? You know, a lot of uh, tooling assumes that for server applications, the file system is safe. Um, depending on the model of your application, maybe you have directories on the server that aren't actually safe. You know, you're writing uh, taint to them. Um, or another application is. Uh, you know, if you're not able to modify that list, then you're ha gonna have an entire class of issues that you are unfortunately blind to, that you are not catching before they go to production. Uh, and most commonly, there's a million third-party libraries outside of the frameworks and that sort of thing that convert unsafe uh, input to safe input. You know, to kind of pick on Microsoft ourselves, we are really zealous with our HTML encode. It converts everything that's not a Latin character to the HTML entity. Uh, if you're writing an application for uh, a region that is not Latin character based, uh, this is super frustrating. And so there's a plethora of encoders that are less aggressive, but still perfectly safe to use. Or you know, conversely, maybe you're consuming Markdown and you're using you know, a Markdown encoder that's not built in the framework. There's no way a vendor knows, uh, or you know, an open source team or whatever knows about 
all of the open source sanitizers and third party libraries that are available, they're going to miss some. Um, or, and they can't possibly know what proprietary ones you've written yourself. So unless you're able to alter those, uh, you know, you're gonna, every time they occur in this pattern, you're gonna have false positives. And again, those results are either going to be ignored or the rule's going to be outright disabled by causing blind spots because of the noise. And then, you know, there's the final problem of like, you know, what if you have a dangerous sync that's not in the default list? Um, a number of tools were slow to pick up that Node.js is a thing. Um, so, you know, their JavaScript analysis is highly focused on DOM-based code, and they don't catch that there's a whole plethora of API that are similarly dangerous in the Node.js world uh, that, you know, kind of live on the server. Um, if you're not able to add that list, you're stuck waiting for the vendor to get around to doing so. Um, so how to address this, uh, you know, kind of most obviously, uh, heavily bias your evaluation to tools where you can actually go and uh, edit the rules, uh, especially if they've open sourced all of the rules. What you're buying from the tool vendor is their engine, not their rule set. Um, so if the rules are open source, you gain the benefit from all of the other folks in this room that might similarly need to go edit the uh, rules, and you yourself can look through them, uh, understand how they work, and make uh, edits fairly easily. Um, if you're using a tool that supports multiple languages, um, unfortunately, many of the older commercial tools, while they present themselves as a single tool, under the covers, they're like completely different products. Writing a rule for C++ is an entirely different experience than writing a rule for JavaScript or C Sharp. So you, like, your skills learning to edit rules for one are not transferable to any other languages. So again, um, you know, the, the, language, uh, the tools in which you know, they've kind of made that a unified experience, that'll make it much more feasible for you to like, edit the rules. It will also make it much easier for them to maintain the rules that they have. Uh, and in kind of the next issue, we'll delve into why that's important. Um, you know, the language or kind of technology that the rules express, uh, get expressed in is really important. Um, more modern tools uh, have kind of a very terse, easy to understand, easy to edit language uh, that you, know, you can very easily see how it's leveraging the capabilities of the tools and how to edit it. Um, older tools, uh, not so much, and I'll pick on my own company again. Uh, we have this tool called Prefast. Uh, it's the native analysis tools that are exposed in uh, Visual Studio, uh, that's an ancient engine. And the language that the rules are written in is C. Uh, and many of these rules are thousands of lines of C code. It's a pain in the ass for us who knows what they do to edit them. It's not remotely feasible for anyone else. Um, and, and that's, you know, a lot of the older tools in this space uh, unfortunately commit a similar sin. Um, and so, like, looking at that, that will make it a very large barrier for you to make the, like, edits necessary to kind of drive down the false positives within your own code base. Um, if they don't document how to do this, uh, it's the same thing as you not being able to do this. Uh, none of them have a large enough community to have an appreciable presence on Stack Overflow or, you know, blog posts about it or whatever. So, uh, you know, if they haven't documented it well, you have to reverse engineer the tool to figure out how to do that, and none of us got time for that. None of this is true. At the very least, make sure that you know, if you're buying a commercial tool, you have a service contract that includes them making these edits for you with an SLA to back it up. Uh, and don't let them charge you more for that, because they are using servicing uh, to uh, address the fact that their tool is deficient. Um, so definitely point out that their rivals in that space do not require such an agreement. Um, and finally, uh, if you can't edit the guidance, that's just as big a problem. Just like you may have you know, distinct patterns, you know, distinct sanitizers and so forth within your own code base, you need to be able to point people at them to consume them. Uh, so if you can't edit the guidance, uh, there's you know, frequently no way for a new developer on the team to understand how specifically your organization wants them to be fixed. So the guidance should be just as editable as the rules. Um, on to kind of the last catch-all issue here. Um, back in the day when you bought a disposable razor, it had a single blade. And then some genius was like, two blades, twice as good. Uh, and another genius was like, three blades, 50% better than those two-bladed chumps. Another genius is five blades. Ha ha, hopefully we stop there. I don't know, 10-bladed razor next year. Uh, but it's very easy to argue, hey, more blades is better. 
are they? Uh, well, in truth, um, you know, when we look at the changes in the razor blade, the thing that most impacted people's uh, satisfaction with the shave had nothing to do with the blades and everything to do with this little blue strip called the hydration strip. Um, if you put it on a single-bladed razor, they were just as happy, and it was just as overall effective. The thing is, it's way easier to market and try to convince people that more is better. And the same thing applies in the static analysis space. There's more checkboxes on the bottom one. It's got to be better. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of static analysis adoption is not driven by engineers, but is driven by IT security departments and so forth that don't really understand the, uh, the kind of engineering process, aren't really set up to evaluate the tool and that sort of thing. And so, yeah, hey, more checkboxes is better. Uh, what these checkboxes don't say is remotely how effective they are at doing this. And in fact, perversely, they are rewarded for writing more poor quality checks than fewer high quality checks. And I, I think it's pretty easy to infer that if you have just a boatload of low quality checks, uh, that's going to lead directly to high number of notifications, high number of false positives, and so forth. And uh, you know, to compound this, as I you know, pointed out earlier, there's a weakness in static analysis where uh, the effort to support each language is a linear effort. Uh, so, you know, if they support two languages, they should roughly have twice the size of the team. No vendor's doubling the size of their team. So they are either architecting their application really intelligently, or it's starting to lag in its quality. Similarly, many of the tools make it very hard to write and maintain their rules. Now, you know, if we looked at the uh, like kind of last issue, um, that's not universally true. And you know, if we bias ourselves to the tools where it's easy for us to edit the rules, it's also going to be relatively easy for them. But if it's not easy for them, uh, the more checks they have, the worse the tool's going to get over time because languages change. Um, they are never done with a check or with their language support. Um, so they'll have to constantly revisit that. So in fact, the more checkboxes they have, it starts becoming a liability over time. The relevance of those checks will start decreasing, um, even if they were absolutely perfect, which they almost never are when they are introduced. Um, but since a lot of companies buy over more checkboxes, and largely these vendors aren't expanding their teams to try to compete with that, we end up with this very real world example Hopefully this isn't true anymore, but uh, one of the leaders that Gardner identified in their worthless magic quadrant space um, wanted to have as many CWEs covered as possible so they look good, uh, but they weren't resourced to do so. So instead, these are literal checks out of their uh, application. They look for hard-coded passwords and hard-coded cryptographic keys by looking for the substring word and key. Well, uh, first, this doesn't find most hard-coded passwords and keys. Uh, but second, uh, Word and D-Word are data types. And um, there's a small company in Redmond that makes a product called Word that got pretty frustrated when we ran this. Um, and so, uh, you know, but because they were being rewarded for having as many checkboxes as possible, and they weren't being held accountable for the quality of that checks, it pushed really poor anti-behaviors like this. Uh, so uh, I, I would ask you to be like kind of like perversely skeptical of those large checkbox sheets. Uh, and specifically, as you're looking at products, don't run them against WebGoat or .NET Goat or any of the Goat projects. And don't run them against MITRE or NIST samples, because the purpose of all of those is to test the tools for their false negatives, not their false positives. Run them over your actual, like the application code you care about as part of the eval process. And if then looking through the results they give you sucks, running that tool is going to suck. That previous tool I mentioned produced 55,000 security findings when run over Elasticsearch. Uh, you know, funny mathematical fact, 55,000 findings equals zero when it comes to having to triage that. We didn't even bother looking at that. Um, so if like, you know, the, the aspect of you know, kind of looking through the results to see if they're any good becomes arduous, then using it's going to be arduous. Um, you know, also, you know, as I mentioned, accept that there are, are things that static analysis sucks at. You know, it sucks at finding design level problems. If a tool claims to find them, uh, they're liars, and they're going to have, you know, just worthless no uh, findings for you. Um, but 
you know, unfortunately, they're being pushed by, you know, uh, especially IT security teams to find as much as possible to meet all of your compliance check boxes and that sort of thing. We should really punish them for doing that instead of pushing them for, to do it. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, addressing all of the previous issues uh, will kind of lead to also, you know, selecting tool that is overall better, that isn't focused on uh, having, you know, just the most number of checkboxes. You know, choosing the tool that makes it easy to edit uh, rules means that it's also easy for them to edit it. Choosing a tool that differentiates between the dev team and the security team means that they're not focused on having the most number of checkboxes, but rather having the best user experience. Um, so kind of all the other things we went through will also help you find uh, kind of you know, something that will produce a whole lot less friction and frustration uh, in this regard as well. Um, you know, as we're wrapping up, there are other things to consider. Uh, you know, how well the tool integrates into your dev process really matters. Some of the tools still require you to go off to a proprietary portal to view results. Um, you know, as a dev, I want it, you know, either in the IDE or in my work item tracker as a PR comment, I don't want to have to go to some, like, third-party tool to look at it, because, honestly, I'm not going to do that very often. Um, if the guidance they, that it produces is garbage, that impacts the actionability of it. They might as well not even tell me it's a problem if they're not going to tell me why it's a problem and how to fix it. Um, and also, you know, especially for all of the various flow analysis problems, if they can't pull out all of the factors in that flow that cause them to uh, call it a problem, it's going to be harder for me looking at that finding to understand why it's a problem. So they can't just go, hey, you're using HTML.raw, and we found that it comes somewhere into your application and that's dangerous. They need to show where it's ingested and then where it's used so that I can understand, oh yes, that really is untrusted data and it shouldn't go there. Um, so how they present the problem also matters. But generally most of these, most of the tools are doing okay with. Um, you know, most of them have gotten the memo that they should integrate into your dev process and that sort of thing. Um, so that, uh, I've been talking pretty fast for quite a while here. Um, if you have uh, you know, questions that we don't address here, um, feel free to shoot me an email or hunt me down on LinkedIn. I think I'm probably the only Josh Brown White on LinkedIn. I'm willing to gamble on that. Um, you know, I'm not good at uh, necessarily responding to these things in a timely fashion. Uh, notification fatigue happens in email too. Uh, I'm not on Twitter or Facebook anymore because those apps didn't bring me joy. Um, so, we've got four minutes. Anyone got questions? I'll repeat them for the audience, so just shout them out. Hooray, I was completely clear, and none of you have any more questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, feel free to hunt me down after the fact if there's something you want to talk to me about, like kind of individually, or you know, shoot me you know, the you know, kind of aforementioned emails or whatever. I really will get to it eventually. Don't be afraid to follow up if I don't. Um, but anyway, thank you for joining me. Uh, I know that uh, I was talking fast for almost an hour. Uh, hopefully it was helpful. Uh, hopefully that will lead us to kind of adopting uh, better analysis in the space, pushing the crappy tools to get better, pushing the good tools to be better. Um, so thank you for your time. <laughs>